a warm welcome to everyone who have joined us today for this session on Rethinking the Future, Preparing the Industry and the Women Workers for Industry 4.0. My name is Mokshi Kobir. I'm the Director for Communications, Learning and Leadership Development at BRAG. I'm extremely privileged to welcome our esteemed panel today. So here with us, we have Mr. Farooq Hassan, the President of Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, BGMEA. Mr. Hassan had earlier served BGMEA as director for two consecutive tenures from 2001 to 2002 and 2003 to 2004. He has also been the vice president for two consecutive terms in 2019, 2009 and 2011. And he also served subsequently as senior vice president of BGMEA. As president of Dutch Bangla Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the first bilateral chamber in Bangladesh, Mr. Hassan has extensive experience serving as the vice president of the French chamber, alongside being involved in the German and Switzerland chambers in Bangladesh. Welcome, Farukai. We are extremely honored that you could manage some time to join us. With us today, we have Dr. Fahmida Khatun. Dr. Fahmida Khatun is the Executive Director of the Center for Policy Dialogue, CPD, a leading think tank in South Asia. Prior to joining CPD, she worked as a research fellow at the Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies as an environment specialist for the UNDP, as an economist for the USAID mission in Bangladesh. She also undertook part-time teaching at universities in UK and Bangladesh. Dr. Khatun delivers lectures on contemporary national and global issues at top institutes of Bangladesh. She sits, at, she sits regularly in various policymaking bodies. She was director of the state-owned Jonathan Bank Limited. She served as the director of the Small and Medium Enterprise Foundation of Bangladesh. She was also a member of several government bodies. We are really privileged to have you, Dr. Pamela Khatun. Thank you for joining us. We are also honored to welcome our third panelist with us, uh, Oni Chaudhary. Welcome, uh, Oni Bhai. Oni Chaudhary is the policy advisor of the A2I, program of the ICT division and the cabinet division of the government of Bangladesh, supported by UNDP. In his capacity, he leads the formation of a whole of society innovation ecosystem in Bangladesh through massive technology deployment, extensive capacity development, and integrated policy formulation. He is a member of the Prime Minister's National Digital Task Force, Education Minister's National ICT in Education Task Force, and many other important forums. Thank you so much, Anirbhai, for giving us time and joining us today. Bangladesh celebrated its 50 years of independence this year. And when we talk about Bangladesh and in its economic growth, an iconic image that we can all associate with is the garments workers, because they have been the key drivers of our economy. That image of our female garment workers working to their workstations and living for work is etched in our memories. But as the industry is going through a transition now, it's important to think about their sustainability and future. So Farukhai, you have a very important position uh, in terms of not only in the industry, but in the overall economic sphere of Bangladesh. So in terms of the recent discussion around Industry 4.0, the technological revolution, where do you see the RMG industry of Bangladesh in future? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, uh, BRAC and H&M Foundation for this organizing timely uh, virtual global innovation conference. Uh, with the fourth industrial revolution knocking at the door while pursuing man manufacturing excellence, uh, this conference is undoubtedly a time being befitting one. And thanks for inviting me in this panel. And it is my pleasure to share uh, with panel with the panel, Dr. Hamida Khatun and Mr. Ani Choji. With 84% share of the total export earning and contributing 11% of the GDP growth, r and sector has taken the lifeline of the economy. Starting from almost nothing, in four decades, this sector has become the second largest garment exporter in the world, contributing immensely to our economic growth and prosperity. r and sector uh, has created employment of 
4.4 million workers, 60% of them are women, and the Made in Bangladesh tagline is now exporting to 167 countries across the globe. Over the past decade, the industry proved its capabilities and resilience, not only by earning the trust uh, of global brand and market share, uh, but also transforming itself as a responsible undertaking. From child labor elimination in 1995 till today, we are making many positive changes in the area of compliance, safety, and well-being of the workers. Over the past seven years, we made a massive effort in transforming the industry in terms of safety, remediation of factories, and creating a culture of safety of workers. This was done by local and international experts in the area of fire, electrical, and structural safety, and was supported by the government, global brand, and the development partner, including ILO. Uh, the footprint of RMG industry in, uh, in the industry is also remarkable. You will be happy to know that Bangladesh is, is a home of the highest number of lead uh, uh, certified factory, uh, green factory in Bangladesh, 144 green factory now in Bangladesh. Uh, out of top 10 factory in the world, eight are home in Bangladesh and out of 100 factory, top 100, 39 are in Bangladesh. And uh, all we know that uh, for out of 144 factory, uh, 41 are platinum. Uh, right there. And there are uh, another 500 factories are on the pipeline uh, on the different process uh, to get the certification. Uh, these factories take care of many things like reducing carbon footprint, rainwater harvesting, uh, safety work, and with an ambition of reduced GSG emission by 30% till 2030, BGME has joined UN Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Action. BGME as the only association in the world is honored with the 2021 USGBC Leadership Award very recently uh, on the uh, 10th of June. Uh, it is an exemplary leadership in promoting environmental sustainability and green industrialization in the r &D. With all this achievement and con uh, continuous support, Bangladesh is showing its commitment towards sustainability. We have to keep it continue all this transformation and momentum that we have achieved. Uh, but most importantly, we need to upgrade our business model uh, if we cannot upgrade this business capability, the value addition of the industry, the achievement in environment and social front will be uncertain. So the next story of transformation should be around how we can go for innovation, upgradation, value addition, diversification, and the fourth industrial revolution. Therefore, when it comes to the question of staying competitive in the world market, we need to keep in mind that we hold only 6.83% of the share of the global market. And that certainly indicates that we had a huge opportunity to go to uh, grow further and uh, we can penetrate in the diversification product and exploration of new market through innovation and technological upgradation. Volume-based business model is no more an option for us going forward. We need to pursue a value-added strategy in terms of vertical capacity upscaling. If we particularly look at our uh, product basket, we see that 74% of our product are cotton-based uh, garment uh, we are exporting, whereas the global market share now is uh, non-cotton market, uh, non-cotton product of 74%. So it's it looks that we had a huge opportunity to grow further. I will say this: this is a win-win situation in the cotton uh, uh, product. We are a winner. We are already having a 74% uh, share, whereas the market share is 25%, and is a in the non-cotton garments, our market share is only 24%, so where the opportunity is there. Uh, along with that, we uh, we will approach newer avenues of cost optimization and being efficient, including modernization of the industry for IR and develop required skill and companies, uh, the path to uh, graduate from OEM to ODM as we focus more on design development, innovation, and end-to-end -end digital manufacturing. We would encourage foreign investment in the forward linkage industry in Bangladesh, particularly in design center. FDI in the design center will certainly create an extra age for our business and value retention, as well as we, we can create a quality employment. At the same time, we will work to positively shift the industry to enhance efficiency, automation, and product innovation, high value and modern manufacturing process using best industrial engineers practice. Foreign investment in the high-end textile sector, specialized fabric and technical textile manufacturing will bring a new uh, expertise and technologies which will support our next growth phase. 
Moreover, as we have graduated to a middle income country, market access would be a, would be a priority agenda for us and investment in the backward linkage textile industry is uh, crucial for us to be able to comply with the double transformation rules of origin under EU G, G, GPS plus scheme. Additionally, we have to explore a new market and potential FTA partner. As we have a bigger growth vision ahead, technology will be a, uh, a crucial part of the next stage of our investigation with regard to sustainability, competitiveness, and creating decent employment. Our success will depend mainly on developing skill and efficiency of our people and creating decent jobs for them. We have to make our supply chain lean and green. We have to ensure te technological upgradation across the production line chain. Otherwise, it will be difficult for us to optimize cost and be competitive in the global market. All this require transition package that includes medium to long-term financing support, availability of infrastructure, energy, the continuous stride towards ease of doing business by our government and the required policy incentive for local and foreign investment would continue to be some of the key, key success factors in the journey forward. Thank you so much, uh, Farooq Hassan. I think you have really outlined well the opportunities and some of the plans that you have for the future of the RNG sector. It's reassuring. Uh, to us that you are talking about not only the midterm but a long-term plan and there's so much positivity in the sector to be really proud of uh, i mean you're setting best practice examples so Parup sanghai will come to you so onibhai um, let me come to you you have been a passionate advocate for the digital transformation digital integration in many sectors in bangladesh so how do you see this automation and ai coming into rmg and do you, do you see it as an opportunity or a threat because there has been a research by um, HY that which you commissioned in 2019 that estimates that at least 60 percent of Bangladeshi RMG workers could lose their jobs to automation by 2041. So I would be really interested to hear your perspective on this. Thank you very much Motushi. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Uh, good to be here with two distinguished panelists. Uh, Farooq Bhai and Fami Dapa. So really a pleasure to be here. So Farooq Bhai has laid the foundation of what I'm going to talk about. So Motushi, as you pointed out, so automation, like any large uh, power, such as, uh, let's say nuclear power. Nuclear power can generate electricity for us, can also be a weapon of mass destruction, right? So automation or uh, ICT, and with the new uh, technology that we are seeing uh, with the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, big data, uh, robotics, uh, where the digital, physical, and biological merge uh, in a sense, uh, we are seeing that kind of power. And recently, uh, I think uh, uh, it was either Sundar Pichai who talked about that artificial, artificial intelligence could be more uh, powerful than fire. So the way the fire actually uh, created uh, advent, created uh, advancement in, in, in civilization, AI actually will do similar things, but applied wrongly, just as fire can destroy things, nuclear power can destroy things, AI can also, uh, automation can also destroy things. So uh, we're really looking at it from that perspective. Um, ILO did a study a few years ago of the uh, ASEAN countries and predicted that automation will create a job loss of more than 80% in the RMG sector. And this is across many countries, not, not in Bangladesh. We talked about uh, many of the East Asian countries as well, uh, China, Vietnam, uh, some South Asian countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, obviously. Uh, the study that we did in 2019 that you pointed out, uh, look, we looked at five sectors, RMG being obviously the most important one. And the study there uh, also shows that in the next uh, 15 to 20 years, about 60% of the RMG sector jobs will actually go away because of automation. And the uh, fourth industrial revolution actually just uh, accelerates that process because we get more efficient machines, uh, more intelligent machines. So when we talked about automation at one point, let's say five years ago, we were talking about dumb machines. Now we're talking about intelligent machines who can actually use a huge amount of uh, data 
and make decisions uh, similar to what human beings can actually do. And we're talking about a paradigm in about 20 years or so that we're calling singularity. So singularity is a time when a machine becomes more intelligent than a human being. So this is going to happen as predicted by many futurists in the 2040 to 2045 time frame. So what then happens to human beings? What then happens to our workers? What then happens to our managers? What then happens to our entrepreneurs like Farooq Bhai? So do we not need entrepreneurs then or do entrepreneurs only depend on robotic managers and workers? So that's the, that's the important question to, to answer. So the same study that we did in 2019 also looks at the new jobs that are being created. Uh, so it talks about a computer numerical controller. It talks about computer aided quality control professional. It talks about computer aided design uh, for fashion design. So some of those things that Farooq has talked about. So what that really means is the menial jobs are going away, but the more high order jobs are actually emerging. And if we don't train our personnel, our people in the industry, or maybe from other industries with these new skills, then these skills will be required by the industry. The entrepreneurs will publicize these skills, but will hire people from other countries to fulfill this demand. So the industry is not going to sit idle because the industry has to be competitive. The industry has to be able to cater to the demands of the globe in terms of design, in terms of production, in terms of productivity. So obviously, uh, if we don't cater to that demand by developing our own skills, doing new skill development, upskilling and reskilling, then those jobs will exist in Bangladesh. It's not like the jobs will go away. These jobs will be created and they are being created, but they will go to the hands of our neighboring countries, people. So they will go to the Sri Lankans and Indians and Vietnamese people, just as it has if you look at how many uh, people we employ in the RMG sector and many other manufacturing sector from neighboring countries, it's actually quite astonishing. The amount of money that we send outside of Bangladesh every year uh, is close to about $10 billion uh, for mostly mid-level managers that we employ in the manufacturing sector. And that includes the RMG sector. So there are many, many uh, uh, important considerations at play. So the first thing I'll talk about is uh, the hard skills, the hard technical skills that we need to develop. And there is a dilemma because the people who will lose jobs cannot really be trained with the new skills that are required because the education level is at a different, different consideration. So the menial jobs uh, which are being done by near illiterate or maybe uh, uh, primary school graduates or maybe secondary school graduates cannot be done uh, by, uh, uh, I mean, th those jobs are going away. So the new jobs that are, that are coming cannot be done by these people. So these people will lose their jobs and new jobs will be created for the tertiary graduates. So graduates from polytechnics, graduates from fashion design institutes, graduates from universities. So therein lies the dilemma. So what do we do with uh, these uh, people that are losing jobs? Now, uh, the second thing I'd like to talk about is productivity. Uh, there is there is study there are studies that show that the Chinese workers are probably three times as productive as Bangladeshi workers. So, which basically means even if our uh, cost advantage is is uh, quite high, in terms of productivity, we always get beaten by our Chinese counterparts. So, from an industrial productivity standpoint, per person productivity, I think really needs to be measured. And we need to put some benchmarks. And recently we had a discussion with the, the National Productivity Organization. It's a small organization within the government under the Ministry of Industries. Nobody really, I won't say nobody. I mean, not too many people know about this organization. But I think uh, there has to be some uh, effort to strengthen that organization because that's the only organization that I know within the government in Bangladesh that measures industrial productivity and actually provides training on increasing their productivity. So I think in terms of increasing productivity of our workers at different levels, uh, I think that's, that's a national priority that we need to set. And we've had discussions with the Ministry of Industry recently and also the cabinet division uh, through an effort that we're calling the 4IR, uh, uh, 4IR enhancement of the government in a sense. So 
focusing on productivity enhancement is also a stated goal of the government now. The third area that I'll talk about is mid-level managers. So creating more mid-level managers from Bangladeshi cadres, not from the foreign uh, personnel that we sort of import from other countries, but really Thank take you. a... Can I continue? Oh, yes, please. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. So focusing on the mid-level managers and really looking at maybe tertiary organizations. And there was a study that uh, uh, we looked at and a study that we're doing in the context of Bangladesh about mid-level managers. The study is it's in, in, in its midway. So I just did a quick review of the preliminary findings and the expectations of the students the expectations of the teachers and the expectation of the employers are completely at a mismatch. So uh, the, big, the biggest mismatch that we see there is in terms of communication, communication skills. So it's not really hard skills. It's not the math. It's not the sciences. It's really how we communicate and how we manage and how we collaborate. That's where the, the, the difficulties lie. And maybe uh, Farooq Bhai will bear me out here is that the, the reason we hire foreign managers is that they have better communication skills. They can handle uh, workers better. They can handle buyers better. They can handle uh, uh, raw material suppliers better. So it's, it's basically that communication skill. And it's not really just English. It's really about how you manage conflicts and how you manage uh, difficult situations and how you manage situations. And that's, that's where I think uh, we fail in our uh, education system really is not equipped uh, to, to developing those, those skills, the soft skills. So developing soft skills and creating new mid-level managers that can handle these jobs and that can handle uh, management properly, I think is also a very important area. The fourth area that I'll talk about is the recognition of prior learning. There is a lot of learning that probably is out there, but we're not certifying that. And if the industry, BGMA particularly, and the Minister of Industry perhaps can work together to do better recognition of prior learning that are required in this, in this new paradigm of 4IR. Right? 4IR requires new skills. Some of these skills are actually already out there, perhaps in a different industry, perhaps within the, the RMG industry as well, but we're not recognizing that properly. So if we can identify that and work together between the government and the private sector, and maybe we can bring in the National Skills Development Authority of the Prime Minister's office into this mix, then I think we can uh, grow very quickly. So the issue of upskilling, reskilling can actually be done at a fairly uh, faster rate. Uh, I'll close with uh, one, one piece of information that I'd like to share, is that the government is very serious about uh, developing the right skills as demanded by the industry. And therein lies the right data that we need from the industry. So in terms of the different uh, uh, training institutes within the government and also NGOs such as, such as BRAC, which produce a lot of uh, skilled personnel, I think we need uh, far better real-time data from the industry and from the globe. Uh, if we can have that on an ongoing basis, right now what happens is the data comes in through surveys, and then we prepare based on the surveys, we prepare our training institutes in the government and in the private sector, develop curriculum, start producing skills and doing reskilling. And by the time those skills are actually produced, the market has already changed because the market is changing very, very dynamically and very, very fast. So we need a feedback loop where the new demands are coming in, the training institutes are equipped very quickly, and the new skills are produced uh, also very quickly so that we are responding to the real-time demand in a real-time production manner. Otherwise, we are going to always far behind and uh, the market will be captured by our competitors or our competitive managers from other countries. Uh, so to do that, we have developed a platform. It's at its initial stage, it's called NICE3, National Intelligence for Skills, Employment and Entrepreneurship, Skills Education, Employment and Entrepreneurship, NICE 3. So this is an effort that we have uh, embarked on with 23 ministries led by the cabinet division. And uh, we are also going to, well, we have already started working with about 
uh, 40 different industry associations, BGMA being one of the most important ones. We've identified pilot projects uh, to give us more informed uh, data points to do this uh, long-term and mid-term planning. I think uh, Farooq Bhai talked about the importance of short, medium, and long-term planning. So this data platform will really give us that. So this is a data platform where everybody needs to share data for everybody's benefit. Because otherwise what happens is we have all these data silos that don't benefit anybody, right? So BGMA may have its own data silo. BKMEA may have its own. In industry ministry may have its own. BRAC may have its own. So if we can actually combine efforts, combine all our data together, then we can start making collective decisions for collective benefit. Otherwise, nobody wins. So that's a platform that uh, we have embarked on. We are working with Singapore Polytechnic for the last uh, two years or so to identify what we call four IR pilots. So there are 50 four IR pilots that we have started, many of them with the industry and actually several with BGMA. And the cabinet secretary has had a number of meetings since January to look at how four IR can really benefit us. So looking at the, the negative sides of 4IR and how to combat that, and looking at the positive sides of 4IR and how to leverage that. So that's what we are doing with the cabinet secretary as, as, as the chair of that whole effort. And uh, we've also sat with the uh, BGMEA, BCCI, and many other industry uh, associations. And uh, what the cabinet secretary has asked every association and chamber to do is to develop a 4IR cell, uh, which is a dedicated uh, unit and it has to be, it could be one person, half a person, but a dedicated unit that looks at, as I said, the challenges that 4IR brings and the opportunities that 4IR brings and address the challenges and leverage the opportunities. So that's what uh, the collective intelligence uh, platform and the public private partnership that we need to put together to address uh, the 4IR issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anu Chaudhary. Collective decision for collective benefit, I think you have beautifully said that. And we have seen from A2I's efforts in the recent pandemic that how collaboration and bringing all the partners together can help us to respond to a crisis. So speaking of crisis, I'd like to come to uh, Dr. Fahmida Khatun. Fahmida um, Khatun, you and CPD has been closely working with women workers and looking at gender issues. Like in any transition and transformation, we know that women are particularly vulnerable. So from your perspective and research, how do you think this industrial change, this automation are going to impact the women workers who are really the backbone of our energy industry in Bangladesh? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Motushikavir. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, BRAC and H&M Foundation for organizing this event and inviting me. Uh, I think uh, my previous speakers, Mr. Farooq Ahmed and uh, Mr. Ani Chaudhary, both of them have detailed discussion on, you know, in terms of the RMG sectors, prospects and challenges, and also what would be the specific challenges in view of the four IR and how the Bangladesh government has been working towards overcoming those challenges. Now, um, the specific question which has been posed by you towards me is that, of course, and as we have heard from uh, Mr. Farooq Ahmed, that this is a sector which engages um, with large number of women workers. As you remember, when it started uh, in the mid 80s, 80% 80 of the labor force within this sector would be uh, the women workers who would be coming from the rural areas and the semi-urban areas of Bangladesh. Now, um, after you know three decades, four decades, now uh, in I think a couple of years back, um, our center had conducted a study and we have found that the number of women workers has significantly reduced to uh, about 53%. Uh, some studies also find that about 60%. So, which means that you know, a significant reduction in uh, female participation in the sector, So, which is a bit of worrying because this has been a sector which had contributed not only through not only towards women's empowerment, but also the welfare of a large number of families who depend on their income. So the social and also the uh, cultural and um, nutritional, all these aspects have been fulfilled 
to a large extent because of the contribution of these women. So now what are the, you know, what are the reasons? Many studies have uh, you know, found that, and also Farooq is here, he can also you know, um, substantiate or vouch for it, that uh, the, the, the tenure of working in the industry may not be a long, very long. And particularly for women, it's that you know, once they start family, once they're married and they have children and they have a larger family, increasingly they become, uh, it becomes difficult for them to continue. But uh, so as a result, many leave. But the fact is that once they leave, it should be, you know, it should be filled up by new workers. So this is not happening. Why it is not happening? One of the reasons we also found in that study that many have uh, been facing the challenges of adapting to the situation, new situation, which is that replacement of the, you know, um, of many machines, the work who, which is to be done by uh, workers. Um, so those are being replaced by uh, the machines. Not only that, the new machines are being you know, coming, which needs more skilled labor. So it happens so that women are relatively less skilled in those jobs, in the new jobs, which are being performed by, you know, in combination of, with human labor and with the technology. So, and as uh, Mr. Farooq Ahmed mentioned, and also Mr. Ani Choudhury, that the future will see more and more and rapid changes towards the uh, more technology-based uh, economic activities. And also since we are talking about productivity and we are want to be, you know, we want to be com competitive with the other competing countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, China, of course. So the efficiency and productivity, these are the key uh, preconditions in order to compete in the global level. And also very important is that since Bangladesh is going to graduate from the least developed country, um, so after 2026, uh, maybe we will get another couple of years of grace period. But the fact is that we are we after that we are going to compete with other countries. So that uh, so that is going to be a crucial period in the sense that once you compete, uh, the one of the important factors could be you know saving you is that more productivity so that the the efficiency is higher and the cost of production is lower so that you remain competing you can compete you can produce the same number of uh, you know uh, garments like other countries uh, which are global competitors so this is one of the important challenges and also you know that bangladesh is at the same time is going to be a, an upper middle income country you can, uh, by 20 30, that is an ambition. So these are the global you know, challenges, apart from the local domestic challenges. Now, why women are lagging behind in general, this is the specific uh, sector we are talking about, but in general, when you discuss about science and technology and women, so there is this perception that women are not very comfortable in studying or, uh, math or science. I think there are, to partially it is true, but there are some factors which are inherent within our economic and social construct. Uh, so the first you know, challenge comes from the family itself, the parental uh, psychology or the parental influence that, that the daughter may not be able to cope with the, uh, with the difficulties which the science subject would provide. So there's this whole lack of confidence comes from the family itself. And also the so social uh, stereotypes are there because um, that kind of you know, social outlook or social attitude that liberal arts subjects are for girls and science subjects are for boys. So that also you know, influences or the, build the mindset of the uh, girls who uh, start their education. And this is related to other issues that peer norms and pressures. So if a girl you know, sees um, that most of, the, most of her friends or other students in the school are 
uh, doing the liberal arts subjects and very few are in the science subjects. So that also you know, gives them a lesser confidence. Um, and also that's why this is linked with that, that we have learned very few role models in that who are pioneers. Of course, there are in uh, now, nowadays it's coming up. And if you look at the universities, many you know, students who are with the science faculty, they are doing excellent, they're the toppers, but then the numbers and ratios are not so significant. This is one. And looking at the RMG sector, if you just see that, which are, who are the working there? Mostly those who are, you know, um, low paid in the managerial uh, level, very few women are working. And those who are working as a, as a worker at the, at the low end, then they are educated you know, at the same level of education as the, you know, as the co-worker, as the male co-worker, maybe HSC or HSC. But again, when it comes to operate a machine, the, uh, you, know, you will find that the men would be coming forward more than the girls. So why does it happen? Uh, is it an inertia among the women or is it a fear? or is it a lack of opportunity? So that is what we need to uh, look into. And also the, the employers, the entrepreneurs, they will have to actually come forward and take proactive measures. Of course, this is a combination of all. I can't single out any factor that, you know, it is just a lack of opportunity, but it also is a fear and also lack of confidence and of course the opportunity and sometimes we prejudge also so overcoming the whole challenge not only in the sec rmg sector but in general women's participation in technology based work uh, which is going to be more and more in the coming days as we have heard from matani choudhury so i think you know a huge investment is required in general he has rightly pointed out that there's a huge mismatch between the employer and the and the uh, the supply of the education which you have. So the, the demand and supply mismatch is huge. So huge investment is uh, needed for the whole education system, and also particularly for the girl children, uh, so that their um, education towards you know, uh, more science and technology based uh, interests are grown and also the awareness among them, uh, not only the girls, but also I think the awareness among the decision makers, decision makers at the policy level and also decision makers at the factory level, at the industry level, that is also there. So these, they should, the women, they, sh they should themselves know so that what is coming, what will happen, and what would be the impact and how can we tackle, tackle that? So if they are really scared of adapting to or adopting to the technology, then they will be just out of that market totally. So uh, there, is, there needs to be also uh, awareness uh, among the family level also, among the parental level and among the social societal level. Uh, so uh, with this, I would like to end, I think, then we can come back to, you know, sure. to the, uh, more questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fahmida Khatun. And you have very well articulated that this is not an industry specific issue. This is not a challenge that's only facing the RNG industry and they have to solve it. The onus falls on each and every one starting from on the families to society to educational institutes. So, uh, Farooq Hassan, I'd like to come to you, and there are some very good questions from the audience as well, that two specific challenges are being discussed. One is uh, loss of risk of loss of job by lower skills uh, jobs. So it, does the RMG industry have any plan in terms of sustaining those jobs for women workers? And the second challenge is how do we increase the ratio of more female ma workers in managerial roles? So how do we upskill them? So I would like to ask you two questions. One is in terms of the RMG industry, do you have a roadmap? And also as we discussed, this is not an isolated industry issue. So what is your expectation from the different stakeholders in terms of how different stakeholders can support you in this journey. Thank you. 
Uh, first of all, uh, we all know that because of the technology upgradation and uh, four IR, uh, there is a uh, loss. There is going to be loss of uh, job. Uh, but I strongly believe that uh, because the RMG industry is uh, at the at the beginning, there will be disruption in the uh, job. Uh, but because of backward and forward linkage, there are. Uh, the, there will be a new job is going to be created and we are creating job on that side. On top of that, uh, in the swing in Rusty, uh, with the machinery, we cannot uh, completely uh, do a complete automation. So there will be still uh, quite a good number of uh, job uh, over there. And uh, if we can increase our uh, efficiency productivity where well, we all are talking about that, that the, we have to increase our efficiency, our productivity, and we are working on that. Uh, and, and the government is working and we are working. Uh, we have uh, uh, set up a uh, fashion university, uh, the BUFT, and then we are running quite a number of te uh, uh, technical institute uh, training center. Uh, recently, we have started setting up a innovation center, uh, uh, center of efficiency. Hopefully within the next two months, we are going to start the operation of that one. So by that way, we are going to increase the efficiency. and. Uh, being uh, hopefully we will be a more competitive and then if we, if we become more competitive uh, we can increase our market share and by increasing our market share obviously we can employ more people over there because right now uh, uh, pre-COVID situation our export was about 34 billion dollars in RMG export uh, so this year uh, end of June uh, the export will be about 31.2 billion dollars uh, but there is a huge uh, opportunity as uh, uh, we are only doing, as I said before, we are doing about 6.83% uh, of the total market share. So there is a scope to grow further. Uh, and uh, uh, I believe that uh, the number of uh, the female workers, uh, yes, it is reduced uh, in, in over the years because initially, uh, uh, there are uh, much less workers at that time, uh, more female worker was working, but uh, later on, uh, more male worker uh, have started joining. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Palmer they are right to say that uh, the female uh, workers after doing uh, 10 years or 12 years, somebody worked after 15 years, and then they want to have a family or they go back to uh, hometown and start small business over there because they start some earning money and their children have started making money. So uh, maybe they are not going to uh, in a higher uh, uh, places, but their children are coming up and they are because many of them, even we have put uh, more than hundred of our uh, employee, uh, the girls are uh, studying in Asian Women University. Uh, we have, uh, uh, so like that way, we are uh, trying to give them employment and, uh, and uh, the higher education as well. And uh, I believe that uh, in coming days, by increasing the efficiency, productivity, uh, we can uh, employ more uh, uh, women over there. And uh, as... Uh, okay, so in terms of, as we, the industry needs support to solve this, right? The industry needs support from different stakeholder groups. So what is your expectation from the different partners and stakeholders, including the government, who can help you in this roadmap? Oh, uh, as you know that, uh, basically we are doing our uh, job because uh, we are addressing all the issues. Uh, uh, you know that uh, right now we have the highest number of green factories, so we are going for a green industrialization, the compliance area, and uh, if you see that in uh, last uh, year, in 2020, even in ethical manufacturing, we scored the second in the world. Uh, just after Taiwan, we scored. Uh, have, this is an international recognition. This, uh, this is audit was not done by BGMA uh, or any. Uh, uh, this is done by Cuma, the Hong Kong based, uh, the uh, world number one top uh, audit company. And they scored Bangladesh in ethical manufacturing. We scored the second. So. I believe that uh, what we are doing, we are on track. We need uh, uh, support uh, from the government, which government is doing uh, with us. 
but we also need uh, big support from uh, the development partner and as well as uh, from the buyer because uh, uh, we as we are looking for a, their ethical buying the ethical sourcing because we are doing ethical manufacturing we comply and we address all the issues raised by international development partner uh, ilo and we are addressing all these issues so i think this is the time and we always say that uh, uh, we need to have a ethical uh, like we have a green factory we need a green prize as well but uh, unfortunately we are not uh, getting a green prize rather our government have supported by reducing two percent uh, corporate tax who have set up a uh, green certified practice so our government is giving initiative but the uh, the brand the buyer is not supporting that so uh, we are looking forward uh, from the cooperation from the bank uh, from the uh, brand that and we are working very closely with them to get more orders and uh, as uh, mr uh, anish they have uh, given a lot of uh, suggestion and uh, we will work uh, closely with you and uh, with the government and uh, i can promise you and uh, this the new board uh, which has just taken over two months back. Uh, it is an elected board after eight years of the election. Uh, it's an elected board, and we are committed uh, to our members and to all the stakeholders that uh, we will work very closely and uh, grow together, getting all the support uh, from government stakeholders, the buyers, and the development partner and the NGOs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farouk Hassan, especially on the note of optimism and the spirit of collaboration that you are uh, promoting with, uh, from BGMEA. Uh, on Ibrahim, maybe this question can come to you. One of the audience has asked that you spoke about upskilling, especially in the mid-management sector. So in terms of educating mid-management and women workers, is there any good practice uh, either in Bangladesh, in different industry or globally that the BGMEA and RMG industry can learn from? We are working very closely with ILO right now to actually find these uh, good practices. Obviously, they have some. I think Vietnam is a good example where the formal education system actually creates skills that are required by the industry. So there is a so there is significant investment in education, much more so than we have in Bangladesh. Uh, but also in terms of skills development beyond the formal education, I think there are good practices in Vietnam that we want to want to bring to Bangladesh, obviously contextualize in our reality. We don't want to just cut and paste. I mean, that's not going to work. And that's again where uh, industry, the academia, the, the formal academia and the government and the government institutions that actually provide training need to work together. And also, again, as I mentioned, uh, large uh, uh, non-government organizations like BRAC will also have to participate in, in, in that. Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier in terms of mid-management, the two skills that are extremely important, one is English, but more importantly, communication, just general communication skills, conflict management skills, uh, because there are many different types of decision making in a complex environment such as RMG, uh, where you have so many different actors acting together. If you look at uh, the entire supply chain, I think upstream and downstream, I think there are many different types of communication that actually are needed. So what we could potentially do is to create communication package uh, that is catered to the RMG industry for middle management. So it's not like general communication and general English. So we actually cater to the needs of the RMG industry and maybe take a targeted approach to develop women mid-managers. And that is very possible. I think we can actually see significant progress within one year. I'm, I'm quite convinced of that. Again, looking at best practice from around the world, but also best practices in our industry, I think can be leveraged, can be actually spread across. I think we may find really good practices in maybe uh, some, I, I won't mention names, but I'm sure BGMA can probably come up with 50 factories where there are really good practices on one thing or another. And if we can actually harness that, create a repository of best practices and spread that around, and we will be very happy working with uh, BGMA doing that, and that's where you see significant, again, collective decision-making for collective good, collective benefit. I think those are things that we can do very easily and uh, quickly. I think uh, speed is the name of the game. We don't have much time. Uh, the world is changing uh, because of COVID, because of 4IR, because of many externalities. 
And we just don't have the time to just sit around and watch. We have to take the lead and act very proactively and quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. I think Bangladesh in general and the RMG industry has been very resilient and adaptive to the different changes. So it's very encouraging to hear that there are best practices within the industry that we can promote and learn from. So uh, looking forward to hearing some of those best practices. Coming up on the next question uh, is uh, relevant to you. You mentioned, you spoke about some of the challenges that our women workers and in general women face in the society. So the question asked by our audience is often it is stated that women are not interested to take promotions despite having the qualification. So what is the root cause behind this? Is it structural discrimination where uh, that doesn't support women to go forward or is it inherent lack of confidence? So from your experience, what have you seen as the root cause? Okay, thank you very much. Very important and very uh, widely discussed uh, question, I, I think. Uh, and issue. Um, I think, as I have mentioned, I think it's a combination of economic, social, cultural, religious, all these factors which have formed our mindset and also the work environment and the educational uh, system also. Now, uh, as I have mentioned that during when a girl enters after the uh, you know university or college education uh, you will see you know nowadays women's participation in the labor market not only in the informal market but also in the formal market that is increasing in the service sector a large number of you know girls young girls are entering but as i have mentioned that you know at certain stages as the, you know as when they are about to you know, uh, move up the ladder uh, towards the mid management or so. They are also at the you know at the at this phase of their uh, family life is uh, that's also very important. So they have to play the role of a wife and uh, mo prospective mother, and also the role of you know sometimes the daughter-in-law and all everything else. So that is the time when many girls, even the educated ones, and not only in the RMJ sector, but also the highly educated and uh, those who are in the white color job, very prospective jobs day. So the balancing is a very, very you know, difficult thing. The, you know, we sometimes discuss that the professional clock and the biological clock for women, uh, they are in, con in a total conflict actually but you we can't deny the situation the reality so for that we'll have to actually um, create a situation create an enabling situation where they can uh, also you know pro prosper at the same time also you know keep a balance with their family of course you know the word balancing i find it very difficult because you really can't balance between the two somewhere you have to put a priority but again uh, so giving the priority you can do both uh, and many women have overcome that with their own you know family support with their own willpower but the thing is here it has to come as a, a total package from the policy makers the, the whole system has to be such that it, it is enabling for them. So I'm talking about the policy making at the uh, highest level. So that the, you know, for example, it is Bangladesh is one of the few countries, of course, I would say that, you know, here we have uh, a matter of leave we pay and all many advanced countries even don't have. But again, that's not also enough. Uh, so that is one area. And then secondly, if we look at the you know, family structure, and now we don't have this joint family anymore. So we have only a small family, nuclear family, nucle uh, so nucleus family. So uh, that's where the support of the government would come in the sense that if we have more daycare center uh, and reliable daycare center, not only from the government, but also the private employers, you know, where the substantive number of women are working. So that is there. And also once, you know, many, quite often, once uh, the women 
once they are ready to come back to the labor market again, once their children are grown up and they want to, they desire to come back, they would find that their skills are irrelevant for the labor market. So we don't have any opportunity to reskill them, to upscale them, to the, you know, skill their, uh, their knowledges, they give them skills in a way which are relevant for the labor market. So that is, again, that is one of the other important bottlenecks that we don't see many women at the higher level, at the managerial level, at the top management level. So I think, you know, this uh, time is running out. Uh, I would say that this is an area where both the government and the private sector and the non-government sector, they all should work together. So these are structural bottlenecks, of course. And I don't, you know, the question you said that this is also whether that lack of confidence, I think that there is, you know, some amount of lack of confidence, but that is much less than before. We have now role models, uh, you know, across various industries. So they can also, they are inspiring for the other girls, but the situation is not the, yet ready for them. So we have to create uh, an enabling environment for them so that they can come, a larger number of girls can come to the labor market and they can stay the course till the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela Khatun. With that, uh, we have to draw a close to this fascinating conversation. On behalf of BRAC, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists for taking time out and join us. Thank you also to our partner, H&M Foundation, and all the different audiences from all over the globe who have joined us for this conversation. I think we can summarize the conversation on three key points. One is we cannot leave anyone behind. As the industry is going through this transformation, we have to analyze how this is impacting the major stakeholders, which is our female workforce, and have to have plans proactively to offer solutions to them. The second point is the need to upskill our uh, in staff for the new kind of jobs that will emerge. So this is not only a threat, it's an opportunity. So really being proactive, offering new skills and increasing the ratio of female in the mid-management level. And the third important point that came through all the discussion is the need for partnership, because this is not an industry specific issue. This To solve this complex challenge and to make the future foolproof for the industry, for our women workers. It means concerted efforts for everyone involved. So with that note of collaboration and partnership, uh, I'll draw a close to the discussion. Thank you again for joining us. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent moderation. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.